paid this debt I need a resurrection somehow And now I'm lost in your freedom And this world I'll overcome My God's not dead, he's surely alive He's living on the inside like a lion, God's not dead, he's surely alive, he's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, he's roaring, he's roaring, he's roaring like a lion, he's roaring, he's roaring, heaven roars, fire falls, come shake the ground with the sound of revival the heaven roll the heaven roll and by your fall shake the ground with the sound of revival He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. He's roaring, he's roaring. He's roaring like a lion. He's roaring. He's roaring. He's roaring like a lion. He's roaring like a lion. Good morning, Hope Church. First service. I got that echo thing again. <laughs> Halloween's coming. Hey, listen, isn't that awesome that we got the youth band here today? So Kat, our lead singer here, was telling me we have to feel a little sorry for her because they went out yesterday and went to a, oh yeah, we, don't, we feel sorry for you, Kat. We really do. We're worried about you. They went to a children's fair at St. Nicholas yesterday, them and our other youth group band, Heaven's Echo, and played for several hours outside of our church. You went to another church and performed. That's so awesome. You guys are good. I think that's getting out of the box that we're supposed to be doing, isn't it? Speaking of that, uh, we have uh, a volunteers that do Blitz. Blitz is an organization here in the church. It's just a group of people that go out and they, they help the homeless. They provide them with food and stuff like that. And there's a sign up out there and it's a pretty blank page right now. And Don, right here, raise your hand, Don, is going out tomorrow or the next day, and she can sure use a hand. We hate to send her out there alone, as small as she is. We're worried that she'll get consumed or something like that. But she could use a hand. So if you could talk to Don during the announcements, that'd be great, and give her a help. I want someone to go out there with me. I need help getting everything ready before. Okay. And talk to Don if you can help at all. Just do something for her. Anyways. Uh, we also, every church I know has an archery program. <laughs> okay, not really, but we do. And if you would like to just come for a, a, this, Sunday, this Saturday, coming Saturday between 10 and 12, come down here at the church. We'll have archery set up and you can learn more about it and shoot a few arrows and try not to hit the deer that wander through our church parking lot because there's a lot of them. So if you've got any interest at all, stop by Sunday, Saturday morning at 10 to 12 here at the church. Now, we had a hike yesterday. Uh, every church has a hiking ministry, right? I was told they had between 16 and 19 hikers, so I figured they had 17 and a half hikers yesterday. Anyways, you might check our table out there. We do have a hiking program, and it's once a month. They do hike, and, and they do have a good time, and it's always the third, usually the third Saturday because I work that day, and thank you anyways. Swell, guys swill. Anyways, man camp's coming up. Uh, uh, uh. 
signups out there. It's, we had to change the date on it. It wasn't this weekend or next weekend. It's uh, October 9th through the 11th. So please sign up and it is a really good time. It's up at Meadowbrook Ranch. It's close. Uh, it's easy to get to, half an hour drive, and, and it's really a good, good program. We have a nice time there, and it's not expensive. And, and Mike Bauer said if you can't afford it, he'll pay for it because he's rich. <laughs> or not. Okay. Uh, Halloween is coming. <laughs> That's why I got this cool thing here. Starting next week, um, if you have any inclination to, we'd appreciate it if you'd start bringing candy in and stuff like that. We put on, we don't call it Halloween anymore, do we? We call it something else, politically correct. Boo for politically correct. Anyways, we have a good Halloween program here. It's safe for the kids and stuff like that, and it's a lot of fun. And one of the best parts of it is you get to uh, throw sponges at the pastor. <laughs> It's kind of cool, and it's all free, of course. But if you would uh, start thinking about bringing candies in or Halloween decorations that are kind of not gory and bloody and junk like that, just positive Halloween directions, uh, you know, stuff to bring in, please bring it in. Start bringing it in next week. That would be great. And with that thought in mind, say hello to somebody you don't know, and say hello to Dawn if you can help her with Blitz. Can you all stand and worship with us today?
says in the Bible that Jesus rescued us and delivered us into his kingdom. In him, we have the forgiveness of our sins. He brought us together with God through the blood of his cross. you came to my rescue and I, I want to be where you are. My whole life I placed in your hands, God of mercy, humble. Presence at your throne. 
And you came to my rescue and I want to be where you are. And I go. you came to my rescue and I, I want to be where you Thank you. 
They're such a great group, and if you know them well, uh, you know that they're um, very sincere and just great group of people. I just love them, and we now have a third band that's come out of that. It's been a dream for me to be a place, a be a place uh, where the arts are celebrated, that the world shouldn't have just the great artists, that the kingdom of God should have great music and, and vocals, and which is music that God put in in uh, vocal cords and sincere, uh, fired up celebration. And what's really cool is when it starts happening, they start attracting other artists. And that's what's going on here. And I'm, I'm just praising God for that, living a dream. Now, uh, we're in a series, and we're studying uh, something called basic training. And then we're doing growth groups during the, the week. We had people in growth groups uh, last week. And you can find a list of those out in the lobby area on the uh, table out there. And um, there's, there's people going to groups that weren't. We saw a huge increase of people that are in small groups and, and then really great comments. So it's so exciting. And feel free to check out any of our growth groups. And if you don't like one, uh, that's okay. Keep looking and find that one where you feel like you fit. And we study what we're talking about on, on Sunday in these growth groups. They're sermon-based groups that will last uh, another 12 weeks. So hope you'll check that out. Now, I want to do a survey before I jump into uh, part two on who is Jesus. Those of you who are believers, all of us who are believers here, I want you to think about when you made a decision to become a follower of Jesus, and the question is, did you only have a public message? You had no, you didn't have a mom like me that taught you about God, or an elder, or a teacher, or or a friend that got in the scriptures one-on-one in a small setting, could be a small group or one-on-one. You only heard in a large public setting the preaching, and you made the decision to become a follower. Raise your hand. Okay? 
Okay. Now, if you had someone in a one-on-one setting or a small group teach you more to understand the scriptures before you made your decision, raise your hand. Okay. It's usually, I think, more of a, a, of a larger amount. Uh, it's pretty, it almost looked even, which is surprising me, because usually 80% of the people, and I've done this all over the U.S. and in other countries with believers, when you ask how many of you had some form of one-on-one discussion with you, some type of Bible study individually before you became a Christian, and I figured something out. If, people, if most people come to Christ with uh, personal Bible studies, then we need to be having studies. And I know you're thinking right now, this guy's brilliant. How did he figure it out? If most people become believers through studies, there should be Bible studies. Few studies, few baptisms, um, a lot of studies, lots of baptisms. It's not because of what we do, but it's the Word of God, the message. It's not the method. It's the message that causes faith. So that's why we wanted to take my Bible study series that I've been using for years and do a series on it. And you can take this when we're at the end. If you're a believer and you've been wanting to share with someone and afraid, you don't know what, how to do it or you don't know enough. Or Our problem really is we, we know more than we think. We know too much. We don't know how to succinctly, clearly give people an overview of the Bible. And that's what this, it's actually a seven-lesson series is all about. I'm not trying to sell it. Sound like I am. I'm not trying to sell it. It's free. Uh, but it's the best message there is. And I want in the rest of my life to keep training others to win just one more. And so last week, we're going to review what we looked at. We were talking about who is Jesus, and we said that Christianity is all about Christ. The Old Testament says someone is coming. And then when you get to the Gospels in the New Testament, it says someone is here, and it tells us about the life and the teaching and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It ends with him saying, uh, go make disciples. And then you get into the epistles. They tell churches to remain focused on Jesus. You get the revelation. It says someone's coming back. He's, he's the conqueror. It's all about Jesus. And I didn't get that growing up. I kind of thought of a churchianity, I think, uh, more than uh, uh, a person. And, and when I started studying afresh later in life, I saw it's all about Jesus. Someone's coming. Someone's here. Someone's coming back. And, and there's these remarkable claims made about Jesus that are set him apart from all other religious leaders in, in all of history. And if they're not true, Christianity is a joke. But if they're true, it's the greatest news that's ever happened. And last week we looked at that Jesus existed in a real time of history. We have a genealogy, a family tree. The Easter Bunny doesn't have a genealogy. You know, once upon a time in a faraway land is how fairy tales uh, start. When you read Luke, for example, he tells us about Caesar Augustus. And people, you and I can go to the library and look up, and we have a real time setting in history and so, uh, number two, he, the, the remarkable claim that John makes is that he's eternal, that he is God, that he is deity. Um, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing's come into being that has come into being. When I read that, I thought, really? Jesus is the creator? You read Colossians 1, Paul says that all things were created by him, for him, and through him, and he holds all things together. Gravity doesn't, Jesus does. I didn't know that there's this cosmic Christ. I kind of thought he got started at Bethlehem, but when you get in the scripture, he is part of God. Three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. And John is saying Jesus is eternal, and he came to communicate the, the unseen realm. You know, you have a two-story universe illustration. By the way, there's a handout in the bulletin if you hadn't seen that. And in that, in that handout, there's a two-story universe, the top level, the unseen realm, the eternal realm, where you have God, where you have angels, uh, and spiritual realm. And then the bottom level is the physical realm, man, flesh. It's a temporal uh, realm, temporary. And Jesus, what John is saying, communicated the unseen realm to the physical realm. He, in a very dramatic and powerful way, came, became flesh like one of us to show us what God is like. And so if this is true, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened in all of history. The mind of God, the Word of God, became flesh and was walking around on the earth like we do. We need to be re-amazed. Those of us that are believers, sometimes we are kind of, oh yeah, I've heard the story. If this is really true, this is the greatest news of all news. 
And so we also looked at a very practical point that Jesus is the ideal role model for us to follow. It talks about him at age 12 that he was subject to his parents and he increased or he grew in wisdom and in stature in favor with God and man. The ideal balanced life. He grew mentally wisdom. He grew physically stature. He grew spiritually in favor with God. He grew socially in favor with man. Some people look really good physically, but socially talk like can't communicate. Uh, some people are really popular and good with men and, and, and women and humans, and, but they don't have a spiritual uh, hunger in their heart. And humans will let you down. I wanted a hero all my life. I want a role model all my life. I wanted someone to follow. And when I found Jesus, here's the ideal role model. He grew mentally, physically, spiritually, socially. He's the ideal role model for men and women. And Christianity is a way of life. It's a following. It's not an intellectual thing only. It is a call to follow and imitate Jesus. So this week, we're going to look at three more points about Jesus as we conclude lesson one, who is Jesus. Number one, or number four on your outline, only Jesus' death can pay for all sin. Only Jesus' death can pay for all sin. It says in Romans 23, and if you have a Bible, turn there with me. Romans 3, 23, Apostle Paul is writing. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? All. all. Is there anyone here that hasn't sinned? No. So there's no need for us to walk around like we've got halos on our head and look down our nose at other people who disagree with us on things. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Go to Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you work on a job, you earn something. You earn wages. What does sin earn? Death. We're going to look at this in a later lesson in a couple of weeks. I think it has to do with uh, eternal separation from God. That is death. That's what would make hell hell if God's not there. Because God is love and God is light and God is life and God is everything good. I don't want to be where God's not at. So all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are death. So we got a problem if we all sin and the wages are death. And you go to Romans 5. Romans 5, 8 through 10, same writer, says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When did Christ die for us? While we were still sinners. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? And so Paul says that while we were sinners, aren't you glad that God didn't expect us to get it all together and be perfect before he would accept us? Because we never could, even if we pretend. And he says that while we were sinners, Christ died for us, and through him we're justified. What does justified mean? Yeah, I like simple definitions, and justified really means it's just if I'd never sinned. He doesn't just forgive us, he wipes the slate clean. You need to understand, if you've been very promiscuous, and you've been fooling around, and you've, you feel ashamed of that, that if you come to Christ... If you come to God and you ask him for forgiveness and you trust in him, he makes you pure. He wipes you clean. If you've stolen, if you've lied, no matter what it is, the world will, will keep track. The world loves scandals. The, lo the world will mark you. They will try to define your personality based on mistakes you made or what was done to you, how you were hurt or abused. God doesn't do that. He sees his son and daughter. He sees Christ. You're wrapped in Christ. And it's just if I'd never sinned. He also uses another churchy word, reconciled. What does reconciled mean? Brought back together. Good, def good simple definition to bring two together. To make friends. He made peace by the blood of his cross, it says in Colossians 1. He brought us together with Christ. When you go to 1 Timothy 2.5, 
it says there, um, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. So he says there's how many mediators? One. If there's uh, only one mediator between God and man, do we need others to mediate for us? We don't need Joseph Smith, who years and years later tried to become a mediator. We don't need writtens by diff different denominationals. We need Jesus as our mediator. He's our only mediator. And the cool thing about Jesus, he's God and man. He's going to do what's best for God, and he's going to do what's best for man. Can you imagine sinning three times a day? You, some of you are thinking, that's a good day. <laughs> I didn't mean to look over in that direction, Mike. Uh, you know, if I, if I lie, shade the truth, we call it a white lie. We kind of try to gloss over sin, but a lie is a lie. If I, if I lost control and went in a rage, there's nothing wrong to get angry about certain things. Jesus got angry. Uh, and, but the Bible talks about fits of rage, to not lose control. If I the Bible, the Bible says to obey the laws of the land. Let's say I'm going way over the speed limit, and I know it, and I'm willfully doing it. The Bible says, some of you are going, oh, boy. Uh, the Bible says, uh, um, well, you get my point. You know, we can go on and on listening sense. Can you see yourself doing three a day? Now, let's say you did three a day for a year. How many would that be approximately? A lot? <laughs> How about a thousand approximately? A thousand at three a day in one year. How many, if you sin three times a day for 10 years? 10,000. Do we have a problem here, Houston? It's not hard to see that it's pretty easy to have a problem. Now, how many sins does it take to be guilty? One. If you, if you murder once and you go to the judge and you go, I'm, I'm really not a murderer, I only did it once. He's going to say, no, you're a murderer. See, one is enough to separate me from God, and this shows me I need grace. And our sin leads us, and the law leads us. We're going to see that later in this lesson, in another part of the series, that the law brings us to Christ. It shows us our need, all of us our need. I'll just be really blunt here. I believe hell is going to be full of the good old boy. The person who seems to be nice, and everybody thinks is wonderful. He treats people nice. He's nice to his wife. He mows his yard. He doesn't kick the dog. Seems to be like a nice person, but he never bows his or her knee to King Jesus. That's called pride, the creator of the universe. So this is a serious point. Only Jesus' death, the perfect Son of God, can, do it, can pay for our sin. We'll look at that in another lesson. Number five, Jesus rose from the dead and is still alive. When you go to Matthew 28, 1 through 10, I'm not going to read it today for time's sake, but it shows Jesus appearing uh, before some women, and, and they're blown away, of course, and he says, this is beautiful, do not be afraid, and he says, go tell my brothers, it's a beautiful passage, when, when you go to the empty tomb, it says, uh, do not be afraid, go and tell, and uh, then uh, they do that, and then in Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, he, taught, he lists some people who Jesus appeared to and shows us there were lots of people that Jesus appeared to and he, and he was risen from the grave. Interesting point, in Mark 16, uh, it, when the women go to tell the brothers, the disciples, that Jesus is risen, does anybody remember how they reacted? Typical guys, right? They don't want to listen to the women. You're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. They don't believe. The first people to share the gospel of the, the empty tomb are women. And then the guys change. And look at Acts 2. In Acts 2, verse 32, we have Peter, one of the apostles. Peter, who denied the Lord, uh, and then he's sorry about that he comes back. He's preaching. This is the birthday of the church, Acts 2. And in verse 32, Peter says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Calls it a fact in the NIV. If you go to Acts chapter 4, verse 33, you have 
with a great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. What was the central theme of the preaching of the early church and the apostles? Jesus, if it's about a person, we got to remember that. Churches will let you down. Pastors will let you down. Humans will. Jesus will, let, will never let you down. And then we see right here a, a big core of that about Jesus was the resurrection. These guys went from skeptics who didn't believe the women to preachers, proclaimers. Then they went from proclaimers to even martyrs. Most of them died because of their faith. Why? They said they saw Jesus risen from the grave. And if you think about it, uh, Saul of Tarsus is another great uh, witness to the resurrection. So, who was Saul of Tarsus? Paul. Okay, what was he doing when we read about him early on in Acts? He's persecuting Christians. What kind of guy was he? He was a brilliant, educated uh, probably a young man when it first started, which is rare that the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, would give approval, a letter for a young man to go and stomp out Christianity, which they believe a heresy. So this guy was a zealous and born in the right family, respected. When he walked down the road, they went, ooh, Rabbi Saul. And something happens, and he becomes a preacher and a church planter, plants churches all over the Roman Empire, suffers a lot of persecution, and and then writes most of our New Testament. What changed him? He says Jesus appeared to him uh, risen. So you have the early disciples like Peter and James and those guys who became the apostles. They went from skeptics to believers to proclaimers and even martyrs. Then you have Saul of Tarsus who went from a persecutor to a proclaimer of Jesus. Ever think about how they never found the body? Where was Jesus buried? He was buried in a tomb where? Jerusalem, right? He was crucified. And where did the church begin? Jerusalem. It's not very long after that. Who guarded the tomb? Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers were like Green Beret. Roman soldiers were bad dudes. You didn't want to mess uh, with a Roman soldier. And they guarded that tomb. And yet that seal, that guard could not prevent the resurrection. Now, do you see any point for Romans to go and hide a dead body? You know, how do we feel in our country, the government, if there's rioting of certain parts or subcultures of our country? We don't like that, right? There's rioting going on between the Jews and the Christians. If the Romans who had guarded the, the tomb could say, here's his dead body, go home, settle down. They couldn't do it. And the guys who guarded were in hot water for losing that body, not knowing where it is. How about the Jews who were unbelievers? Because the first believers were Jews, but there were Jews who were unbelievers who crucified Jesus and rejected him. Do you think they would have liked to produce that dead body? They say, you guys are a joke. Here's his body. Buried in the same place, the church starts a few days later, 50 days, not very long, starts same place, no one can find the body, how about the Christians? Do you think they went, let's go, I got a great idea. Let's go hide the body and then go out and be martyred for it. Great. Who wants to join? Doesn't make sense. I'm not going to tell you that Christianity is not a way of faith. It is a way of faith. It's not science in that we can see with our senses and see Jesus. We see through faith. But your faith is not a blind faith. There are evidences. When you go to the courtroom and you say, I want to be a witness for this accident, and if the judge says, did you see what happened? No, but I feel really good about it. The judge is going to say, get lost. Our whole judicial system is based on eyewitness testimonies, and we have recorded eyewitness testimonies that Jesus rose from the grave. I don't know of any religious leader in history who has claims that he rose from from the grave. The last point is Jesus will judge the entire world. When you go to John 12, 48, it says that uh, Jesus is actually talking in a context that he didn't, he didn't come to judge. It's not that he wants to condemn. He wants people to be saved. He loves people. He came for us. Uh, but then he, he makes this statement in verse 48. There is a judge 
for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. In other words, if we reject Jesus, we're separated by Jesus from Jesus because we chose. Jesus is a gentleman. He won't force you. He won't make you choose. He gives you free will. I believe that's one of the reasons there's evil and suffering in the world because of free will. And so uh, Paul says in Acts 10 that one day everyone will give account and that Jesus is the ultimate judge. Again, he didn't come to judge. He came to save. Now look at John 20, verse 30 and 31. This is the end of the gospel of John that's making claim after claim about who Jesus is. And in John 20, verse 30 and 31, John says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Why does John tell us he wrote these things about Jesus? So that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ. That word Christ is the same as Messiah. It's the Greek is Christ. Uh, Hebrew is, is uh, Messiah. It means anointed one, Savior, the one they've been waiting for, the one who rescued us. Uh, like Kat shared at communion talk, that he rescued us, uh, the Messiah, the Christ. And then it says the son of the living God. That means same nature of in the Hebrew mind when they said son of. Like when they called Barnabas the son of encouragement. It doesn't mean his dad's name was encouragement. It means he was an encourager. James and John, the sons of thunder, the guys who said, hey, let's rain down fire. Uh, that's before they became the apostles of love. And, uh, and they, their nature was thunderous. Jesus is son of God. Jesus is son of man, son of God. He's God, he's flesh. And John says, I wrote these things that so whoever believes in him, they would have eternal life, life in his name. So the most important question, and when I study with people, I look them in the eye and I have them read that verse and I say, I'm going to ask you a question. Not because I'm anybody but because I care about you. And maybe all you can say right now is I'm not sure or I need to give it time. I just want to help you process this information. I do it after every lesson. I, I want to help you process this information. Can you at this time say that you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. Amen. You made it through lesson one. <laughs> when you see the real Jesus, it makes a difference in your life. When you see the real Jesus, Jesus, it impacts all of your life, and I'm going to show that more fully in this series. When you see the real Jesus, you think about who you choose to marry or build a relationship with. When you see the real Jesus, you think about what kind of career you do or what goes on at work, what you say yes to, what you say no to. When you see the real Jesus, things that used to worry you don't worry you like they used to. See, the problem is too much of our culture has a little tiny Jesus they got a little tiny Jesus in their pocket, and when they want to do what they want to do, if it says something different in the Bible, they kind of say, well, my Jesus doesn't mind. they got a nice, sweet little Jesus. Or there's some bold enough to say, well, he was a nice guy. He was a good teacher, but he's not God, and he's not the way. The only time we don't uh, we are narrow in America is when someone tries to be narrow. We love our options. We go to the grocery store, man. We got, we got all kinds of cereal. We got light Coke and regular Coke and old Coke and zero Coke. We love our options, so don't be narrow. But my point is, if Jesus is the Son of God, if Jesus is eternal, if Jesus created all things that's been created and all things were created by him and for him and through him, if Jesus loved us so much that he laid down his life and he died on the cross for us who were sinners, not because we're good, because we're sinners, if he rose from the grave and conquered death, then he can be the judge. He can be narrow as he wants to be narrow, but he's a beautiful, loving great God. He's not a hateful God. He loves you more than anyone can love you. No human has the capacity to love us like Jesus. When you go to Revelation 4 and 5, there's a throne room scene. And John the Revelator is writing about this experience. And he's in the spirit. And before him is this throne in heaven. And there's someone sitting on it. And there's this appearance of jasper, carmelian, a rainbow, 
uh, resembling an emerald. So all this brilliant colors encircling the throne, beautiful, brilliant colors. And surrounding the throne, there's 24 elders, which I mean, I think means representing the church. There's these leaders that are all around him. And, and then there's, there's these creatures there, these winged creatures that are there. And there's a, from the throne comes flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And before the throne, uh, there's these lamps that are blazing. And there's spirits of God, seven spirits of God. And, and before the throne, there's what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And in the center around the throne, these four living creatures cry day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then you have these creatures saying that day and night, and you have the elders falling down before him who sits on the throne. And they lay down their crowns before the throne, and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And then in the right hand of him seated on the throne, there's a scroll. And this scroll has these seals, and no one can open it up. This angel's proclaiming a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is able to open it. John says, I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphant, he triumphed, he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And I saw the lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And then he goes on to say, he took the scroll. And then there's thousands and thousands of angels along with these other creatures and beings that are crying out, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God and they will reign on earth. And then you have everyone, this is the, the part with the angels, thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000 encircled the throne and the living creatures, and the elders, and with a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise, honor, and glory, and power forever and ever. You see, it's not a little tiny Jesus. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He has no rivals. And the greatest decision you'll ever make is, what will I do with Jesus? I pray you'll follow him. Today, if that's new to you, you can just cross the line in your heart and make a decision. I want to follow you. You can pray, make yourself known to me. I did that it's the greatest thing that ever happened, and it impacted all of my life, all of my relationships, all of my destiny, all my purpose, all my mission. And now as I'm getting to be an old dude, I'm looking forward to someday, amen, come Lord Jesus. You spend your life following, looking at him, and you're not let down at the end of your life. It's only the beginning, amen? amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. Father, the word holy means set apart and what a beautiful thing it is that you set us apart our, from our sins, but it's only by Jesus. And we pray that there's some, someone new today that your spirit will call them and they'll put their faith in Jesus so they can have that life. And those of us that are already believers, God, we thank you for Jesus. And we know we're not holy because of our own good deeds. We're holy because of him, because he is holy. He alone is holy. He's set apart. There's no one other like Jesus. And it is him that we worship right now in his name. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord.
Now it's time to pray for our offering. I don't know. That's a little light. Now it's time to pray for our offering. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we celebrate giving because Jesus taught us it's better to give than to receive. If there's someone going through hard times right now, financially help them not to feel guilty at this part of our worship, but to focus on giving their heart to you and, and re the other resources follow in time. But most of all, you want our hearts first. And God, we pray for those of us that are uh, prospering, that are committed to the vision of hope to give cheerfully as a form of worship. Take it and use it, Lord, and make us a force of hope on the ridge and beyond until Jesus comes to get us. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love, love God, God, love people. So remember, every single day this week, in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here. I guess before we start the next song, there's a birthday here. Ray, it's your birthday. He ran, ran outside. outside. Somebody grab Ray. Go grab Ray real quick. We have to, we have to sing to him. Can we try?
Oh. Well, let's sing really loud so he hears us, okay? Ready? <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ray. Happy birthday to you. Cha cha cha. <laughs> Thanks, guys. This one, uh, Keegan wrote. thought it could get this bad. And you think there's nothing in this world that can make things better. But there's one thing, one thing that changes it all. There's a light, a light at the end of the tunnel, and it wants to be found. This light is the Lord, and he wants to be found. The Lord, our God, sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. God gave the greatest sacrifice of them all, his own son, for us. And all I can see. For everything and all I can do is give praise to you and all I can say is thank you for everything and all I can do is give praise to you You're the one I can say. 
I can say Thank you for everything And all I can do Is give praise to you Yes, all I can do Is give praise to you You guys have an awesome week. See you next time.